Praise God. Brother Elwell, are you there? I'm here. Oh, Good we're so happy guys to have you. Oh, yeah, it's mm-hmm. so great to have you. Um, yeah, folks uh, emailed us. They were really excited that we were going to bring you back on again. We got a full house. Mm-hmm. Numbers are very high right now. Praise Jesus. Uh, folks are very, very interested in um, in in your in your research, and um, you know, I'm, I'm sure by now they're also very curious how you um, uh, perceive you know the progress of this. You know, based on your research and the timing of you know your analysis of its uh, of its uh, uh, trajectory. You know where you think mm-hmm. it might be, where when you think it might maybe manifest potentially uh, that kind of stuff. But anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and turn the mic over to you and say, "Have at it, praise God." Okay. Uh, right now, no one knows exactly where Planet X is at. The, uh, the mainstream scientific community believes it's somewhere south of the ecliptic. Uh, that it actually, and its orbital path is actually at an angle to the ecliptic. So it spends most of its orbit actually below the other planets, you know, relative to Earth's North Pole. But when it approaches its uh, perihelion in the asteroid belt, it actually uh, comes up through the uh, plane of the ecliptic and and is actually, when it comes closer to the sun, it's actually higher in the sky than the other planets. So it's kind of interesting. It is an interesting um, orbital path. Right now, most scientists think this gets coming somewhere from the south, and the general consensus is that that I think it's actually coming from the uh, constellation of Taurus. It'll appear in or near the uh, horns of Taurus or possibly in Orion or somewhere in between them. It'll probably travel around those uh, constellations as it approaches. It'll probably come through uh, Taurus and then pass over Orion and so forth as it passes through the plane of the ecliptic. Right now, we don't know exactly where it is. We're pretty sure... um, if it is going to be the sign of the Son of Man, the end of the age, that's going to appear suddenly in the, in the heavens as a heavenly sign of Jesus' second coming. Now, exactly what does that mean? It says in Matthew twenty-four thirty that uh, the sign of the Son of Man in the end of the age will pre- precede the second coming of Christ and possibly be even a part of it, because it says in Matthew 24 that there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets themselves or the powers of the heavens themselves will be shaken. It says in Matthew twenty four twenty nine, uh the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and the powers of the heavens are literally the planets. So this means literally that the orbits of the planets will be altered in the tribulation of those days, which is the, near the end of the tribulation. And then right after that, the uh, sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens, with, uh, and Jesus will, uh, he says, the sign of the Son of Man, and the Son of Man himself will come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so this happens right before the uh, the uh, resurrection event uh, described in Matthew uh, 24, 31, where he sends his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and the elect are gathered together from the four winds. So somehow my theory was is that the, the planet itself is somehow related to the resurrection event, and it's also related to the great end-time battle that will happen at the end of the time at the end of the tribulation. Some people think that the resurrection or the rapture will occur at the beginning, some at the end. Some people are preaching two raptures. I'm actually a, uh, what is called a seventh trumpet rapture person. I think that actually the, the, the appearance of planet X and the, the final assault on earth from heaven and the, uh, the assault on the uh, forces of Satan will be about the same time. Basically what happens was is the believers are resurrected the heavenly army is formed, and they return back with Jesus to fight against the powers of, of evil. And Planet X will be an intrinsic part of that. In fact, it's very similar to the uh, the kind of the storyline of uh, the original Star Wars movies, in that there's this huge planet-like object coming right towards them, uh, a, a, along with a star fleet and the rest of it. The major difference being in in the movie of Star Wars. The people with the approaching planet and the, and the fleet and all the rest, those are the bad guys, whereas in the end times it appears that those will actually be the good guys. Jesus will be leading this sort of heavenly army uh, right behind him. Planet X will be kind of basically being used to wreak havoc on Earth with various asteroids and comets, as described in uh, the uh, the trumpet events. Those are basically what sound like asteroids and comets striking the Earth which are probably emanating from or uh, being as a result of Planet X's near passing. So a lot of what we're seeing with the uh, with the uh, tribulation 
is the description of the sort of events that would happen if a large planet passed by Earth. You'd have asteroids and comets, comet-like objects striking Earth because those are probably going to be its uh, uh, orbital path. And so it makes sense that you'd have giant, uh, you know, heavenly mountains, what are described as burning mountains and these great uh, other objects that really really sound a lot like uh, comets and asteroids striking Earth because that's what will happen. And Jesus himself says he uh, he uh, is immediately preceded by the, the sign in heaven. And so what my theory is, is that the sign in heaven described in Matthew 24, 30 is actually planet X, which has a, an orbital period of roughly 2,000 years. And every 2,000 years or so, God has been reappearing and visiting Earth to see how things are coming along. The last time he visited was when Jesus was born, and the uh, planet X appeared as the star of Bethlehem. And next time he appears, he'll be returning uh, to conquer and take over the Earth as the conquering king rather than as the suffering servant. And the next time it appears, it'll be, uh, appear as the uh, sign of the Son of Man at the end of the age, as described in Matthew 24, 30. So with planet X, we basically have this, this uh, large planet, which a long period orbit like that of a long period comet, which roughly 2,000 years or so. And every time it comes back to Earth, or in the vicinity of Earth, and it's close past to the sun, God will actually come himself in some form down to Earth to visit Earth and see how things are going. 2,000 years before, uh, 4,000 years before, he appeared to Abraham along with his two servants uh, in a visible form. This when uh, you know, God came to visit Abraham, right before he sent his two servants to take out Sodom and Gomorrah. He actually appeared with, uh, spoke to Abraham and visited with Abraham. It was interesting to note then, uh, the, I think it was the Apocalypse of Abraham or the Testament of Abraham. One of those apocalyptic or apocryphal literatures about Abraham's life, he was actually described as being, having his birth uh, preceded by a heavenly sign or star as well. And so that was my, my hint to say, well, this is Planet X having reappeared back then too, roughly 4,000 years ago. Then he appeared around 0 AD uh, as the star of Bethlehem. And if he reappears in our time, once again, roughly 2,000 years later, uh, the sign of the Son of Man is probably a description of yet another appearance of Planet X. So we have a cyclical uh, pattern of God returning every 2,000 years or so, preceded by this star in heaven, and when major events are about to happen, for example, the birth of Abraham in his life, which was a major event, the birth of Jesus 2,000 years later, Jesus' return an additional 2,000 years later as a sign of the Son of Man. So its exact position is unknown. I personally think, however, it is approaching. But it won't be visible from Earth until uh, it passes the orbit of Jupiter because, like comets, which are mostly a very dark uh, asteroids, which... Which have, which have some uh, water on it, on their surfaces, which gives them their comet tail. Most of these asteroids and the comets are actually covered with this thick, tar-like organic goo, which makes them pretty much invisible to optical telescopes until they come close enough to the sun for sublimation to occur in their comet tail to form, at which time and only at that time do they become visible uh, by optical telescopes on human eyes. I suspect that Planet X is much similar in the sense that it also has a large preponderance of, uh, of dust and, and dark clouds surrounding it, um, so that it's actually invisible to the naked eye until it comes close to the sun, at which time it actually forms a comet-like tail. In this case, it looks more like a pair of wings, because in the Sumerian uh, images of this of this planet, it actually appears to be... Uh, kind of like it has wings instead of a tail, which is probably just the way, that, because it's such a large object, it probably has a lot more water, and the fluid dynamics of it is a little bit different, but it's essentially an appearance of a gigantic comet, and it won't appear again visible to Earth until it passes, passes Jupiter, at which time the solar winds are powerful enough to start the comet tail to start uh, forming, and that comet tail will then make it visible from, from Earth, uh, suddenly and gloriously, just like Jesus describes, you know, he will reappear like a thief in the night. This is what he's returning. This is what he's talking about. Planet X will suddenly and gloriously become visible within maybe a matter of day, weeks or even days, 
as this comet tail suddenly begins to form, people on Earth will begin to see it and realize exactly what's happening, what's been hidden from this entire time, and what's, what's about to happen. And that's what it says in, in uh, Revelation, I think it's Revelation 6, I'll look that up. Men are hiding themselves under the rocks uh, to hide against the throne of the Lamb because they can suddenly see this thing in heaven and it's approaching Earth. And this happens about midway through the tribulation, I believe, actually, right after all um, the then believing Christians on Earth are, 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 are Christianity, organized Christianity is destroyed and most Christians are executed. Because of this, they, they then see that God's vengeance is coming in heaven and they're about to get really walloped because Planet X is about to attack within the next couple of years. And so, whereas I cannot give you a time as to when Planet X will occur now, will appear, I can say once the tribulation starts, it will most likely become visible about halfway between, halfway through the tribulation, about three and a half years in, three and a half to four years in. And it'll become visible by the naked eye. And then, It'll appear at its, its closest point to the sun, probably about six or seven years into the tribulation, at which time it'll come close enough to Earth to actually cause you know, significant uh, disasters. And that's when you have not only the trumpet judgments, but also uh, the bowl judgments, which are uh, which are the most uh, you know, powerful effects of Planet X as it passes closest to Earth. And then right after Planet X does its damage, then Jesus' heavenly army will attack and wipe out everything that's that's left over, which won't be much because Planet X's attack will be pretty dramatic as you and pretty de, pretty destructive as it's described in the Book of Revelation. We see these bold judgments where you know all life in the seas is destroyed and all the green grass and all the trees are destroyed. I mean, there's not much left, and the major cities are being uh, destroyed. All that's going to be done, left is the basically these underground bunkers, and a lot of them are going to be taken out. Uh, the, the reference to uh, Planet X actually appearing in the heavens, I think the first time mankind actually sees it. And it says that in Revelation 6. Um, where the kings of the earth and the great man and the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens on the rock of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is coming, who shall be able to stand? I think they're actually they're actually seeing uh, Planet X beginning to appear, and it's, this actually happens right after uh, the sixth seal. Basically, what sounds like a massive meteor shower, uh, it says in uh, Revelation six thirteen, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. What this means is that the, the meteor shower, like the long day of Joshua, there were so many uh, heavy meteors hitting Earth, probably at an angle uh, contrary to its rotation rate, that Earth's rotation is actually altered, uh, probably because the crust is temporarily displaced from the mantle, and it becomes you know, independent of the mantle temporarily slowing down or positively reversing. And in this way, as from our current reckoning, every mountain and island is actually moving its place because the entire crust is being displaced above the mantle by these massive, huge asteroids that are hitting the Earth, causing massive destruction to Earth's cities. There's huge. These are much more powerful than nuclear weapons. Even though they're not radioactive, they're sending out gigantic clouds of dust into the atmosphere, which will result in a nuclear winter. And for years to come, the summer is going to be colder and shorter, and, and the winters are going to be long and very cold. So God is basically breaking down the civilization that mankind had built in opposition to him by battering with asteroid after asteroid after asteroid to the point where when he actually does return at the head of his heavenly army, comprised of the believers who were resurrected, then... Uh, what he'll, he'll be more of a mop-up action rather than an actual battle. And they'll be focusing on taking out the last strong military force, which will apparently be assembling itself in the Vale of Megiddo in, uh, I think it's uh, uh, south of Palestine area. But yeah, that's that's kind of kind of kind of the general idea behind the Planet X theory is that it's, it's a planet that 
that's been hidden from mankind on purpose, but has been one of God's primary secrets. In fact, in my opinion, it is actually it is actually the great secret of the Book of Revelation. Um, when I was when I was writing the book, uh, I was I've been studying uh, an emulation some other parallel texts that were similar to, but not the same as um, the biblical text regarding the the resurrection or regarding the creation. I mean, and a number of uh, theologians had noted similarities between. Uh, the Babylonian creation epic and uh, also biblical texts. Some had theorized that the Bible had simply been ripped off from them, but others think that they were just parallel traditions drawing on the same root source material, which is my... And I noted that the description of the Babylonian god Marduk, which is Planet X in the Sitchinite theory, very similar... When I was reading Revelation 4, I recognized the description of Jesus on his throne was similar and kind of scope and concept to that of uh, the description of Marduk on his throne, almost to the point where it, it seemed that uh, Jesus was actually saying, Marduk is a false god, I am the one true god, and it's, I am the king of this heavenly throne. And I realized, you know, what if he was actually talking about Planet X, because it seemed to be kind of the idea behind the end times. If Planet X did exist, it would be a huge deal. And it would be a great secret, a very great secret that had been hidden very, very carefully from mankind for a long time. And if it did exist and it came close to Earth, it would have massive destructive effects. What if it was actually not just a part of the book of Revelation, but was actually the central secret of the book of Revelation, which will be revealed in the end times? And so I looked at Revelation 4, I realized, you know, this is a description not of some big square throne that, you know, the God is sitting in heaven, that Jesus is sitting on. This is actually a description of Planet X itself. Uh, the heavenly throne is symbolically his, his... Planet X is symbolically his heavenly throne. And I thought about that, and I was looking at the description of the throne, and he says it was like a jasper and a sardine stone. This is Revelation 4, 3. And there was a rainbow around it, uh, like an emerald. I realize, you know, he's basically saying uh, sardine stone is basically a red stone. And he's saying this this throne in heaven was a, was a stone in heaven, literally a stone in heaven, that was red. And I'm just taking this really This this book, this thing is saying that there was a red stone in heaven with a rainbow around it, which I think might actually be a description of what a Saturn-like ring system, and which would Planet X would probably have too, because if there was a lot of shadow material in orbit around it, it would form a ring. So that would make sense. Um, and also says around the throne were 24 and 20 seats and, you know, 24 seats, 24 elders and seven lamps of fire burning before the throne and also four beasts around it. I remembered by, in the description of, uh, the appearance of Marduk and Enemy Lish, that he was surrounded by two sets of winds, what he was called, like these objects that he used as weapons. And I remember in the Hebrew, uh, in Hebrew, the word for Spirit, ruach, actually basically means wind. So the concept of these spirits around the throne could be translated as, as winds around the throne, too. And I thought of that, you know, maybe there is a group of, since there's a group of four winds around Marduk's throne and a group of seven winds also, two separate groups. And there's also two, two separate groups of spirits or winds around the throne of Jesus, a group of four creatures, as they're called, and a group of uh, seven flaming lamps maybe there's maybe they're actually talking about satellites surrounding planet x moreover uh in another show i was asked um you know, why do the four creatures are why are they described as having being full of eyes before and behind uh in uh, revelation 4 6 you know it says they're basically covered with eyes and it's uh, it, it basically the, the hebrew word for eye is ion which basically means nothing. It's like saying not or ought. And the concept, the application of the word ion means when you're referring to a person, ion refers to the eye socket or the eye in general. And when referring to a planet or an object of any kind, it's like it has a hole in it. And so if you're talking about these four objects around the throne of God, if this was indeed a planetary concept, and these were actually satellites, so it makes sense because in that context, it would not be translated as eyes, it would be translated as craters. 
just like our moon is covered with craters, so too these moons around planet X are covered with craters, so that makes sense. And so that's so that's kind of where I'm at now. Basically, where we have this is a situation where planet X is going to be returning. We're going to see the same again. It's going to be the most incredible sight. And like you guys were talking about before, this this whole buildup and all these terrorist actions were being herded towards a one-world unified system, where which could be used to oppose the second coming of Christ and all of his forces. So it'll be basically not only the forces of Jesus and the force versus the force of Satan, it'll also be one planet versus another planet. Planet X versus Earth, Jesus versus Satan. It's Jesus' throne versus Satan's throne. You see how that works. And so it, it makes sense at this point, in this, in this context, that this would actually not just be a heavenly sign, like a star or a supernova conjunction of planets. It's, it is actually a planet returning from, you know, the end of heaven after a long journey, returning with weapons of war, as Isaiah describes it, to destroy the whole earth. This is what he's talking about. This is a planet returning, on which Jesus or the Father will be using, Jesus will be using as one of his main weapons to destroy the dragon and his armies. And so that's where, kind of where I'm at now. And uh, but there hasn't been any additional Planet X information coming out recently. Most of the Planet X information of significance came out in the 80s and 90s because of the Voyager probes. And when they flew past the outer planets, they realized there must be kind of a Planet X object uh, out there because that's the only way that can we can explain these anomalies in the outer planets that the, Vo that the Voyager probes found. But since that time, we haven't had any significant stuff because we haven't had any probes out there that have found anything. So right now, all we do is uh, speculate. Right, right. Um, what I think is two, two things. Well, one one thing in particular. Um, uh, Percival Lowell, according to the you know encyclopedias, uh, and I'll, I'll quote I'll quote this to you. I don't I don't know what the uh, citation. Actually, there are several citations to this paragraph. Uh, it mm -hmm. says, Lowell, Percival Lowell's greatest contribution to planetary studies came during the last decade of his life, which he devoted to the search for Planet X, a hypothetical planet beyond Neptune. Lowell believed that the mm -hmm. planets Uranus and Neptune were displaced from their predicted positions by the gravity of the unseen planet. Lowell started mm -hmm. his search program in 1906 using a camera of five uh, inches, uh, in aperture, the small field of view, 42-inch, 110-centimeter reflecting telescope, rendered the instruments impractical for searching. From 1914 to 1916, a 9-inch, 23-centimeter telescope was on loan from the Sproul Observatory, which was used to search for Planet X. Although Lowell did not discover uh, Pluto, Lowell's observatory uh, did uh, photograph Pluto in March and April of 1915. And it goes on to explain that the reason why Lowell uh, ultimately... Uh, even heard about or even speculated that Planet X existed originally was because of his study of uh, gods, uh, you know, little g gods uh, of mm -hmm. um, uh, Japan. And, you know, the Far East and such. And I noticed in your book, you know, you had tied in uh, some of the ancient Near Eastern religion planetary deities. And I wondered if maybe mm -hmm. that was some of the stuff that triggered Lowell into thinking, hey, this might be the real deal and kind of, you know, thrust his research forward. I don't know. What do you think? Well, the uh, the astronomers had always been uh, motivated by the search for extraterrestrial life and try to understand our history, too. And I do think that uh, part of the motivation was to see, since there were 12 gods, maybe there were 12 uh, objects in our solar system to account for the gods. Because in every uh, tradition since Sumer the Sumerians, and probably before that, consistently every major empire uh, passed down from one to the other the belief that all the, pla all the planets were gods, or the thrones of gods would be more specifically, and they were to be worshipped as gods. And so every, from Sumer, um, Akkad, Babylon, Assyria, Persia, Greece, and all the way to Rome, where we have our current planet names, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, these are all Roman deity names. They, uh, they felt that these, they wanted to justify, you know, prove or deny, was the fact that these named after gods that didn't have any significance, was there in fact deities associated with these planets, and were there enough planets to be, uh, you know, account for all these gods. And the Pantheon of 12, it was always 12. 
even since the Sumerians, 12 was the magic number. Uh, the Romans even followed this pattern. If you're missing a god, another one was put in its place to make sure you always had 12. And uh, so Zechariah Sitchin picked up on this, this fact. He had his own twist on it, which I don't necessarily agree with. But um, I, do was, I do believe his theory that the Sumerians were actually talking about literal planets moving through our solar system and causing chaos. I do believe he was correct because – not because I wanted to, because it lines up with the facts. Now, this is not some Velikovsky in garbage. And Velikovsky, was, it was terrible. I can't even read him. Even when I was a kid, I read Velikovsky and I realized, oh, this is garbage. It didn't make any sense. How can Venus emerge out of Jupiter and be in its current orbit? You know, It would have a hugely elliptical orbit if, if it had come outside of Jupiter. It has to, has to have uh, formed in its original orbital path in order to have such a perfectly circular orbit, which is another point I make in the book. Uh, or at least maybe I don't, know, I don't know if I made it in a book. If I've made it since then, why do the ju- the orbital characteristics of Mercury and Venus why are they perf- you know perfectly the way they should be according to normal uh, nebular hypothesis where planets just form out of the nebular disk and they're either prograde or retrograde orbits that is to say backwards they rotate either backwards and forwards um, their orbits will be stable and circular. They wouldn't have any significant moons or circular satellite systems, no axial tilts, no uh, large impacts, no no oceans. They'd be very boring, basically, and they'd be basically the same way they were when they formed, according to the nebular hypothesis, when they formed out of the nebular disk. They're basically the same as they would have done, according to the scientific models, which show that Mercury and Venus are pretty much the way they should be. But when you go to Earth on outwards, every single planet is is an oddball. It doesn't match up with the standard accretional hypothesis. It shouldn't be this way. Earth should not have this 23.5 degree axial, axial tilt. It should not have such a gigantic moon. It's the only um, planet in the solar system that has uh, an ocean, which must have been caused by one or more giant impactors because the Earth's ocean, is believe, is actually formed out of impact events, which forced water out of the mantle, because most of the mantle is actually comprised, most of the water on Earth is actually in the mantle, in uh, uh, water-bearing what are called hydrous minerals, like serpentine and talc, which are partly made of water. And when, they're, when they're subjected to compression by a violent force, such as an asteroid impact, they release the water chemically, the chemical bonds are broken and the water is released. So my theory is that there's the same impact that created the moon, also created the oceans, and thereby the uh, the uh, the atmosphere as we have it today. Because otherwise we would have enough, you know, carbon dioxide and water and related elements to support life, to have the kind of atmosphere we have, the hydrosphere we have, with all the water and the rain and so forth, and the clouds. All these events were created by one gigantic impact, and they could only have been created by one gigantic impact. Um, Earth's axial tilt, its rapid rotation rate, I mean, once every 24 hours. Venus rotates maybe three to five times as much, three to three or four times per year on its axis. We act, and we rotate 365 times per year. Why are we so much faster than um, than, or than uh, Venus or, or Mercury is also very slow? Uh, but Earth on outwards, they're very rapid rotations, as if energy had been added to the rotation by some external object adding uh, energy into the system. So the only way, in my opinion, to explain these anomalies is to say there has to be an external force coming in, adding energy into the planets, by which manifests itself in the form of causing them to spin faster, causing them to have rotational, uh, to axial tilts, whereas they should not have had axial tilts as they formed out of the nebular cloud. They should be perfectly perpendicular to the nebular, you know, the a line of the ecliptic. They're not. None of them are. Uh, even Jupiter has a slight uh, a, a, you know, angle to its uh, axial tilt. There shouldn't be any significant moons. There's no reason to have any unless there's an actor that coming outside the system to penetrate it and cause uh, the creation of a moon because Earth's moon was, it's now universally agreed, was, caught by the, was created by a giant impactor striking Earth at a rapid rate 
an impactor which was roughly the the size of Mars, not Mars itself, but about that size and mass, striking Earth, jettisoning out a large amount of its mantle, which cooled and solidified into orbit around the Earth to form the Moon. That has been pretty much, that has been proven mathematically and chemically that it has to have happened that way. Um, so how do these other moons form? You know, dozens of moons on all these other planets. How are they forming? Um, there must have been an actor coming in our solar system, disrupting them, uh, dropping off moons as it passes through on by uh, Jupiter and Saturn have dozens of moons. They shouldn't have formed that way. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, the ring systems, why are they there? Why does, I guess, Uranus have a ring system which apparently formed after it was tilted on its side? Totally bizarre. Uh, there's so many really extreme anomalies. It's just people who are aware of how things work and I don't understand how physics work and science and astronomy realize that the only way that these things could have happened is if a massive object, roughly three to five times the mass of Earth, possibly seven times, like one man has theorized recently, that's, that's reasonable, um, would pass close enough to them at a rapid rate to cause you know, gravitational interactions, which would cause them to, for example, the planet Neptune to be tilted at a significant angle. Planet Uranus tilted so dramatically that it's almost... Its south polar axis is currently almost pointed directly at the sun, and that's an extreme difference from what it should be. It's like 70-something, 65, 70% off where it should be if it were perpendicular to the angle of the ecliptic. It's way, way off. And so basically right now, the north pole on um, the north uh, rotational pole on Uranus is in total darkness and will be for hundreds of years. But a south pole is, is receiving direct sunlight or near to it, and it'll have direct sunlight for, sunlight for for centuries more. It's it doesn't make any sense. It could only have happened if a massive object passed into our solar system from the outside at an at an angle, you know, uh, at an you know an approach which is more or less perpendicular to the uh, orbits of the planets, and interacted with them occasionally once every few thousand years imparted some of its energy into the systems and caused these uh, axial tilts to uh, causes these moons to form through, uh, you know, just, you know, catastro catastrophic uh, collisions. Um, and the, the, this is not me talking. This is actual the scientists who studied the Voyager data. This is the conclusion they came to. It isn't wacko conspiracy theories on the internet or Zachariah Sitchin or whoever. This is the best people in the world best astronomers, best physicists, best people ever, top men. They said Planet X must have caused this, not me, not Sitchin, not anybody else. And that's why I'm so confident in this hypothesis, because it's backed up by real scientific data. The scientists are saying this, and they've been propagating this, this knowledge for, for decades, just nobody is listening. It requires people to, you have to keep pushing, you have to say, Coming back at it again and again and again. Planet X is out there. Planet X is out there. Planet X is out there. It has to be out there. The science proves it. Why don't you accept it? Why would you not accept it? That's what bothers me. Is people, they don't they don't think about science. They don't care about facts. They're like, what do I want? What do I don't want? And they base their decision making based on their own personal opinions and what they want to see, rather than what the facts state. You can leave the Bible out of it. You can leave Sitchin out of it. Just boil it down to the facts. Planet X has to exist, and it has to fit the criteria uh, that Sitchin suggested, that it's going to enter into our solar system occasionally and become visible. Uh, the scientific, the historical back, the historical data backs this up. Uh, Abraham was preceded by a star that came out of nowhere. The Magi followed a star that came out of nowhere. The second time, second coming of Christ, another star comes out of nowhere roughly 2,000 year gap between each of those. Why is it so hard to understand? I don't get it. Very easy to understand, very simple, backed by facts. Everyone agrees with it. All the traditions agree with it. The science is there. The religion is there. All you have to do is be open-minded enough to accept it, and that is the toughest thing to do, because if you have all the facts, if people don't want to accept it, they will not accept it, and there's nothing you can do to change that.
Yeah, amen. I mean, uh, uh, I did some research on, <clears throat> you know, yellow dwarf stars uh, in the Milky Way galaxy, and supposedly, uh, I, I wish I had the article handy here right at the right at this moment. I don't have another one though, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, but evidently. Um, it's well known by astrophysicists that yellow dwell, dwarf stars, which is what we have, uh, in the Milky Way galaxy, the predominant uh, or, or the, the vast majority of them are binary. That it's extremely common for yellow dwarf, dwarf stars in this in this uh, in this galaxy to be mm-hmm. binary star systems. So, mm-hmm. just de facto, you know, default. Common sense would indicate that we probably probably would be binary uh, as the other ones or the majority of the other ones are. Here's another thing that's interesting, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, April 25th of 2011, published on Cornell University site, uh, is a paper by Lorenzo Lorio, who's uh, an Italian physicist, I guess. Uh, and he... Um, it says, uh, and the title of the paper is, On the Anomalous Secular Increase of the en- Eccentricity of the Orbit of the Moon. What's fascinating is uh, there was a movie, because I, I personally believe, uh, and I know that it's anecdotal in a sense, but there's, when you understand this, you know, when you're a big believer in spirituality, you understand the concepts of lesser magic, you understand how the devil works, uh, and, and how things work, you know, over the years, and, and actually going back thousands of years, uh, it, it makes sense. Um, but anyway, uh, in in this paper, he wrote um, uh, uh, this scientific paper. He basically goes in and he it, – it's all very scientifically you know, written and says you – know, I'll, I'll give a little snippet here. It says basically, a recent analysis of the lunar laser ranging LLR data spanning 38.7 years revealed an anomalous increase to the eccentricity of E of the lunar orbit anoint, uh, uh, um, amounting to E means equals uh, 9 plus or minus 3 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, over the year cycle. The present-day models mm-hmm. of this bit, uh, dissipative uh, uh, phenomena – occurring in the interiors of both the Earth and the Moon, are not able to explain it. And then he goes down, I'm going to skip ahead, he says, um, a potential viable Newtonian candidate would be a trans-Plutonian massive object such as Planet X Nemesis Tyke. He actually quotes those in his paper. This paper was vetted by the scientific community and published in the library at Cornell University, and to the best of my understanding, is still there even today. This goes all the way back to uh, uh, April of 20, uh, 2011, which is fascinating. And then another thing I'd, I'd like to get you to comment on, because I just think this is so cool, and I know that it's very popular to debunk things. I get that. I get that people who are science-minded, I guess they have a feeling or whatever that if they debunk things that, you know, uh, maybe that adds credibility to their story. I don't know. I've seen it happen time and time again. Uh, but, you know, I've been studying this stuff for a long, 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 long time. And I think it's fascinating that in the movie Deep Impact, which, of course, by the way, coincidentally has a black president, which has been brought up a thousand times. In that movie, mm-hmm. you've got this uh, this concept of a meteor ultimately heading toward the Earth. Okay, so pr- most everybody gets that whole premise. Now, what's fascinating, however, <clears throat> other than the – you know the correlation of the events and the similarities between that that presidency and and the things that are going on in the earth today there's one thing in that movie that just absolutely knocked me off my chair when i watched it i was like no way there's a scene actually multiple scenes uh in the movie deep impact where at this point uh this comet quote, uh, is getting close enough to the Earth where it's an imminent threat, okay? And mm-hmm. they, uh, they, they pan the camera back, and they put uh, as the little, uh, I don't know what you're going to, subheading underneath the, the, um, the, the image, they have the White House, the sun is shining above the White House, and off to the left in the sky to the left of the sun is what appears to be a second sun but in fact it's the comet that has gotten to the point where you know it it is reflecting somehow the light of the sun in such a way that uh during even a daylight hour uh you know in this movie you're seeing uh, the sun and then off to the left 
a what appears to be a second son. And in the movie, though, it's actually to be it's actually supposed to be the comet. And it would say two weeks until impact, three weeks until impact, one week until impact. And there's this second son dynamic, you know, a son and a second son. And if you go out onto YouTube, now I've been search I've been researching the second son phenomenon for years, and um, uh, it's real. You know, I, I've had I've had very scientific Christian people on the radio show before, and, and they, they just debunk it. They, you know, that that's their thing. They like to debunk. Okay, fine, that's your gig. If you want to debunk, you be the great debunker. I've been, you know, I wasn't born in a barn. I wasn't born in a barn. Last time I checked, I actually have a birth certificate, and I got a scientific background myself. And it's electronics engineering, and I. I've been researching these things and studying these photographs. I know what a uh, uh, what a uh, camera, you know, uh, lens flare is. I get it, okay. And I and there, all you have to do is type "second sun" on Google and look at. Not all the pictures are necessarily legit, but just look at the body of information that's out there. It's unbelievable, and um, and it, what's fascinating is this: the second sun. Pictures, many of them, are surprisingly similar uh, to the image that they had in the movie Deep Impact. And I'm wondering, do you think it's possible? Uh, and it's okay if you think it's some other anomaly. Who cares? But um, do you think it's possible that there's a, I don't know, some kind of a relationship? Because, you know, back in 2001, there weren't no second sons. Back in two, you know, I was around. I, I have YouTube. I've been doing computers since 1983. I built an XT, a, a eight megahertz XT, on 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 a, on a carpet with a with a 40 watt lamp. Uh, you know, doing a low level <laughs> format in 1985. I've been around. I get it. Okay, and and I've studied this stuff. And I'm t and back in 2003, 2004, 2005, there were no second sons. But then 2008, 2009, Shazam, they're all over the place. They're all over the place. And I'm like, what do you think, you know, just without going into the automatic, hey, I'm a scientist kind of a guy and I'm going to debunk it, because debunking is easy. Any, any NASA monkey can debunk. Okay, what <laughs> are the second suns? What do you think they are? Is it related to maybe in some way to this phenomenon? You know, I, I have no idea. I suppose it could be part of it. Uh, maybe there are uh, large comets uh, passing near the sun they don't want us to know about, or they're trying to, you know, not to scare us. There might be stuff coming in that's dangerous to us they don't mm -hmm. want us to see. Uh, maybe it is a lens flare. Maybe it is Planet X. I really don't know. I haven't seen them, so I couldn't say. The problem is that there are a lot of lens flare phenomena going on. It's difficult to see. Yes. Or, or it's a sun dog or something else. What what's the sun dog and which one's Planet X? I don't have the equipment to tell the difference. And since I'm right. of the opinion that Planet X won't become visible from Earth until midway through tribulation, I tend to ignore it because it doesn't fit into my my worldview. I'm not, I'm not saying I, I couldn't be wrong, but if it's there, it's it's interesting. But um, I think the way Jesus operates. Uh, it says the Lord will come, so come suddenly to his temple. Uh, he doesn't kind of come bits and pieces. It doesn't like it says in you know, Matthew 24, uh, when they say, look at how he's in the desert or is he in a hidden place. No, he's, he says, how does it go here? Uh, if he might say to you, lo, here is Christ, there believe it or not. Yep. Uh, behold, he is in a desert. Behold, he is in a secret chamber. For as the lightning comes out of the east and shines to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. This is a big, obvious thing. Uh, Flatter Nights is not going to be showing up in lens, in lens flare like photos, this and that. It's going to be a big deal. It's going to be an in your face situation. And this is a preliminary to a major, major battle. And so they're, they're going to make it so it has maximum psychological impact. And yeah. that means not flirting around on the edges of the sun. It's well, going to appear this. suddenly and gloriously. Okay, I, I agree. So let me ask you this. I mean, uh, because suddenly and gloriously is like, okay, Shazam, pow, pow, everybody goes, whoa! But could right. there be, you know, I think, I like I like your, your, your you know, the, the possibility that you tossed out there, that these may be mm -hmm. artifacts that are associated with other possibly debris or related objects. Mm -hmm. 
associated with it because I think that is highly plausible. And other people support that, by the way. Um, the other thing I was wondering is um, – uh, let me just think here. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, the um, Do you perceive the the – how do you see the Kuiper belt being um, – you know – What's that a result of? Do you think that and, – and, and this is also linked back to the uh, Professor Harrington thing. Per, as you know, Harrington uh, bought off on the whole deal that Planet X was ultimately a uh, – we'll just call it a, an, a, 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 a planetary object of some type that had, mm -hmm. as they stated, five to seven moons uh, circ, you know, uh, rotating around it. Um, now, of course, there are other theories that suggest that instead of uh, that being a planet with moons, in fact, it was a little bit bigger than that. It was actually a truly a binary star that failed, and it, instead of moons, they were actually five to seven planets that were moving around it, and that we are dealing with a uh, um, another solar system with a failed star uh, moving into our solar system. And of course, if you do some research on the whole brown dwarf deal, uh, you you also discover that a brown dwarf, when it gets just like a comet, just like a comet a brown dwarf when it mm -hmm. gets uh, in the right proximity and uh, heading away from the sun, it ionizes. It forms, you know, ultimately a type of a tail, uh, red iron oxide dust, which could be accounted for the, uh, turning the oceans, you know, red like blood, uh, like like it says in the trumpet judgments. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I just throw that out there. But how do you feel about the the, the Professor Harrington? embracing the five to seven moon theory thing around planet x yeah or uh i'm not sure uh you had a question about the kuiper belt uh, the kuiper belt's still a theoretical yeah. belt we haven't proven it but it's based on the theory that um the comets originate from a, a belt from outside of our solar system which is occasionally perturbed by objects which throw comets into our solar system and that explains why they have long periods which take them in and out of the solar system, because they, when they go back out, they're returning to their point of origin. My theory is that the point of origin of all comets was not the outer solar system, it was actually Earth itself as a result of the giant impact. When the giant impactor hit the Earth, it threw up a great deal of water into the atmosphere and actually into space. In fact, the asteroid belt, we were only a year or two ago, we found out there's a huge amount of water ice on the asteroids, which should not have happened, according to, you know, the hypothesis of stand, you know, how things are supposed to form. Water does not form that way. It form, this can only happen as a result of an existing uh, body of water being basically thrown into space. So that was uh, kind of a proof that uh, uh, the Planet X giant impact theory that I put forward in my book, Planet X, the sign of the son of man and the end of the age. And also I put forward there, that the comets were actually formed from a lot of the water I, that was thrown up by the giant impactor, which also formed our seas and atmosphere. Uh, and also, as a result, there are a lot of the asteroids had a lot of water ice on them. And when Planet X passed on its way out of our solar system, it dragged some of them along with it. Uh, as it surpassed some of these outer planets, they had a gravitational interactions which stripped away the comets and gave them independent orbits. And so that all, all comets and all asteroids, and most, the great majority of them, originated from Earth, uh, being uh, struck by a giant impactor. And then the actions, activity of Planet X moving in and out of our solar system and a long elliptical orbit created these long-period comets and asteroids. Because there are probably long-period asteroids that we can't see because they're dark. Um, so I do think the Kuiper Belt theory is based on false premises that uh, the Comets did, in fact, form outside of our solar system. I do believe they formed from the mantle of Earth as a result of the giant impact. And one major proof to my theory is, uh, which harms the theory, is there was uh, recently a, uh, uh, a, a probe called the Stardust probe that uh, took samples uh, from the comet of Vilta II a few years ago. And they wanted to see, you know, their assumption, which was incorrect, that uh, the comet had come from the outer solar system. So they uh, assumed incorrectly that the dust in the comet's tail would be comprised of elements from the uh, outside of our solar system, and thereby we could determine the chemical composition 
isotopic ratios, that sort of thing of the elements outside of our solar system, and it's, and it's theoretical hyperbell, which has never been proven. But when they actually got this material back, which they had this super sophisticated aero, aerogel, which they used to collect dust in the comet's tail, they then, uh, when they were, when they were, got this material back, they found that the that the uh, chemical composition was not that of our solar system. It was actually identical to that object that had formed in the inner solar system. So this comet had actually formed in the inner solar system, proving the Chiflanid X giant impact theory that comets originated not from outside the solar system, but from within the inner solar system, most likely from Earth, the only significant water-bearing planet. Wow. Okay, so um, so you definitely don't agree with the whole theory that there was a another planet in this solar system that had come into some kind of great impact and busted into a whole bunch of little pieces. Uh, no, the uh, the original um, the original impact that struck Earth was actually still embedded to Earth to this day. In fact, if you look at um, uh, plottings of Earth's core, it's actually slightly off center. Uh, this might be a, related to the Sheol buried into Earth reference in the Bible. It might have to do with this impact here, impactor, which is buried into the into the Earth itself. Um, when it says in Job, you know, uh, Sheol was laid bare, uh, and my interpretation of the Planet X interpretation, my interpretation of that when Job was talking about the Sheol being laid bare in the context of a creation events and. It, a conflict was it actually this is referring to Earth's mantle being opened up as a result of the shined impact, and the inner Earth or Sheol was revealed to the surface. You could actually see it because there was a huge hole that led all the way down the mantle temporarily. Um, this impactor remains in Earth's core to this day, but the uh, the uh, this, this impactor was a satellite, a former satellite of Planet X, which embedded itself inside of Earth. But Planet X itself remains intact. And so the original, uh, the source of the impactor of Planet X remains intact, but the impactor itself is inside Planet Earth as we speak. Um, and remnants of Earth can be seen floating in the asteroid belt and also in the comets and various asteroid groups like the Avars, Apollos, and Atens, and the inner solar system. It could only be explained by that kind of activity. Uh, I, do, I, do, I do hold that Planet X is actually a rocky body or possibly a you know, heavy like an ice and rock. I don't think it's a large gas planet, or do I think? Nor do I think it is a brown dwarf. I think it is actually a uh, just a, a pretty good sized planet, somewhere in size between, uh, let's say, maybe about three to five times the size of Earth, maybe a little larger or smaller. I don't know. Um, real rocky or mostly or completely rocky, and. Um, surrounded by a series of substantially large satellites similar in size to our moon. But it's actually a total of 11 large satellites. It may comprise of two, a group of seven, a group of four, and a group of smaller satellites, 24 in number, corresponding with the 24 elders. And it also has a ring system, uh, a gigantic tail, which forms when it comes, or actually wings that forms when it comes close to the sun, and some other interesting features, which I talk about in my book. Wow. So, and and one of the things you mentioned in the book was, uh, uh, you know, the man in the moon concept with Job, and then the companions mm -hmm. or slash the comments, and then also the echoes of the divine conflict. Mm -hmm. Job, can you connect mm -hmm. connect a couple of the Job dots for us? Uh, because Job is just loaded with all kinds of mysteries. Job was constantly talking about Leviathan and the battle between God and Rahab. Rahab and Leviathan are. are uh, Larea was mentioned a couple of times. It's not always translated into the uh, English text, but it occurs at, le at least two or three times in the context of a creation, specifically a creation battle. My basic theory that Job is actually the Hebrew equivalent of the Babylonian creation ethic, working on the same oral traditions that the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic, drew from, but it, it was interpreted differently and formatted differently in the sense that it was a it was actually a play. There was an opera that was sung. In fact, at the beginning of, uh, of the book of Job, it says, God sung and said, and then Satan sung and said. You know, when Satan appeared before him along with the other sons of God, they were actually singing to each other. So this is actually an opera, which is like the, you know, the Greek plays or the poems. They were sung so they could be more easily remembered because there's a melody going along with these things. And it's much easier to remember the information 
if it's part of a song or like a play because it has you know it has a logical order which can be reconstructed and there's musical notes which will help remind you of certain words the music itself might have special meanings that it's intended to achieve like you know if you have a sudden like dramatic bass sound it might mean something bad is about to happen whereas a high treble sound might mean you know god is you know something bringing his grace there's a lot of stuff we've lost because we've lost the original information the psalms we've lost the music for that too i suspect it's probably hidden inside the hebrew itself in a, in a really clever way so one of my many many long list of projects is to try to figure out do the psalms have the notes the musical notes hidden in them themselves somehow in the hebrew in fact the hebrew might be interpreted as notes itself do the letters of Hebrew actually have sounds and so forth? So, um, but the, basically, uh, Job is basically it's an opera. It was const- it was a constructed tale based on real events in a real person's life. Job uh, was a, a man, uh, a Hebrew, who was the richest man in uh, in the land of Sumer. Uh, he lived near the capital city of Ur which would be Ur-3, uh, probably uh, in existence, I think, around 2500 to 2000 B.C., something like that. And the events, of, uh, I believe, that are timed by the uh, the, script, the beginning of the, both Enuma Elish and the Book of Job. In the beginning of Enuma Elish, we have not one but two appearances of the gods in the heavens. Uh, and, but in also in the Book of Job, we have two appearances of these divine beings, not once but twice. Uh with his appearance of the sons of God got together, they gathered before God along and Satan was among them. This is actually a description of the planets in heaven. Uh, the sons of God in a sense are described as, as a metaphor used for the planets because they cannot use the names of the planets because they are deity names and you can't use that in the Bible. So they use the generic term sons of God. And the fact that they appeared twice was interesting because I'd noted around the, around 2000 BC to 1900 BC, that area, um, there were two massings of all of the planets in one quadrant of the sky. Uh, I think it was around this. The, the first one was like 1970 BC and the ones around 1916, 1914 BC, something like that. And as a result, uh, because of this mass, these massings of the planets are unique in history in human history. It's only happened once like this. You can actually use these massings, uh, this position of these planets in one quadrant of the sky to time the book of Job and also the name Elish, the writing of the name Elish. Because since it was referencing the gods in the sky as a, having a kind of a congregation, uh, the gods are having a congregation when they were talking to each other in the Babylonian creation epic, and the sons of God appear in assembly before God, you know, also in the sky. I do believe that was a metaphor for the a collection of planets in the sky, which was unusual. And thereby, therefore, the actual events of the book of Job, uh, the near flyby of Planet X, happened sometime between 1900 and 2000 BC, uh, uh, based on that timing principle, probably uh, sometime between uh, 1950 and 1920 BC. And I, I don't want to off my original point, but yeah, but, sorry, book of Job. So the book of Job is basically a recitation of a reappearance of Planet X around 1900 to 2000 BC. And at that time, they decided to write down all the information, the oral traditions and so forth they had in circulation at that time and write them down into a comprehensive format. The Babylonians created the Neomalish around that time, and the Hebrews created Job around that time, both different peoples taking their own oral traditions. And there also was some crossover because Rehab and Leviathan are actually mentioned, um, actually Tiamat's not mentioned, so it wasn't crossover per se, but the idea of actual dragons being involved with this mention. Rahab and her helpers are mentioned, and, and, and Job, Leviathan is mentioned uh, a couple of times, at least once. The major passage of Leviathan describing him as being this great dragon-like creature. I actually think that, that chapter is actually a description of God's combat with a dragon. And when it's talking about uh, breathing out fire out of his nose, or of his mouth. It's actually a reference to God breathing out fire, not the dragon, uh, in his battle against the dragon. But I didn't have enough time and space to put that in the book, so I meant it up for a future uh, revised and expanded version if there was interest. But 
Uh, basically, I, de- I determined based on my analysis of the Malish and Chope, and others had done this before, other academic scholars had done this over 100 years ago, the, the primary among them being a man, I think his name was Sigmund Mowinkle, and there were others too, uh, John Day and, uh, uh, and some other prominent uh, academic authors in more recent times. Uh, John Day's classic God's Conflict with the Dragon in the Sea. Uh, that was highly influential on me, too. And he basically went through how there was clear parallels between the book of various passages, of the, including Job, a lot of stuff in Job. In fact, by far the most creation material related, specifically related to the name Elish, is to be found in Job. And I realized, uh, based on that, he, that they were correct, and not only were they correct, they were underestimating the total material involved as I dug deeper and deeper, I realized that the creation battle between God and the dragon was the core concept behind this entire thing. In fact, this was the Hebrew version of the Babylonian creation epic. The only real difference between it was is the way the information was presented. The Babylonian creation epic, they presented in the form of a drama with the names of deities who were associated with the planet. And these deities had this dramatic interactions and there was conflicts and combats between the gods and so forth. Much simpler format, actually, to understand than the more erudite but much more complicated, uh, more literary operatic format followed by, and they were both operas. Both the Babylonian and Israelite versions were both sung as part of their, uh, probably as their New Year's festival. They both, the both of them were probably sung at their respective New Year's festivals. And, the Hebrew version, which, of course, you know, was parallel to the uh, Babylonian tradition, um, it was in the form of, like, uh, a, uh, an intellectual discussion between Job, his friends, and finally God, saying, why is this happening to me? Uh, why was I, you know, I cursed the day I was born. You know, why, you know, why, you know, why, why did the dragon fight against God, that sort of thing. And it was it was it was strangely interrelated with these references to the dragon and its creation battle, and it doesn't make sense unless you realize in its context, this is a book of its time. This was a book written in the context of ancient times in the context of the Demolish. It fits in perfectly with the dominant mid or you know ancient Near Eastern thought pattern at that time, where the creation of the earth was the earth thought of being the head of a dragon, which had been cut off by a divine being that appeared in heaven as a gigantic flaming bright star, struck earth with, with one or more of its weapons, divided it into two pieces. One became heaven, one became earth. And that is the current situation. We're in the situation right now where we're literally living on the head of this dragon, which had been cut off from the rest of its body. And then its tail had been twisted into a great circle of stone in heaven. Uh, Cadian Rakas, which corresponds not only conceptually, but also uh, it's also cognate to the Hebrew word rakia, which is the word we use for firmament. So when you see the word firmament, you, which was incorrectly translated as these, like these hardened bronze plates that formed the, this shell of a universe in which we live in, like in this great sphere. What it actually says, uh, the word rakia means something that is struck and beaten into small pieces and spread out just like the asteroids were from taken, struck from a larger body and broken into small pieces and spread out in a circle in heaven, which is exactly what the Akkadian term rakas means. Rakas and rakia are cognate, they mean the same thing. Somehow, something being bashed into small pieces and spread out is translated into like these bronze flattened out plates, which makes no sense. They're clearly talking about the asteroid belt there. So the dragon's tail was thought of this great circle of stones floating in heaven. Uh, which was one of the heavens, I believe it was the second heaven, two of the three heavens. And the earth was basically the majority of the dragon, really symbolically its head. And we were planted on earth in order to make sure that the dragon would never rise again. Our purpose on earth is to make sure the powers of evil are kept down and not, not allows the right to arise again until the time of the end. And this goes into my larger theory that mankind was planted on earth along with animals and plants to be fruitful, multiply to make sure that the power of the dragon was not allowed to rise again. That's spiritual power. Um, so when we spread across the earth, we had this, kind of this blanket of biomass that keeps the demons from rising again. Somehow, it's an interesting 
concept. I'll get into it in a, in a future book. In fact, my next book in the Giants, I'm going to talk about that because it's kind of one of the core concepts of the Giants is being these these shades that are they are constantly being reborn from uh, beings who died in the world before the flood. They're trying to come back and re-inhabit these bodies of these newborn giants that were specifically designed to be uh, for them to incarnate into, incarnate into. But that's another subject. Um, so, um, if you don't mind sharing with people, what is the, um, sure. what, what what do you think the, the name of your next book is going to be? I don't want to give the name yet because uh, I don't want people to copycat. But uh, it's 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 nearly done now. I've been seeing that for a while. I understand. And I apologize, but I, I've I've come to the point where I can actually finish it up now. I'll probably have it out. I'll probably have it out by next summer. And so, uh, just in time for the tribulation to start. So, get your seatbelts fastened. <laughs> yes, get your seatbelts fastened, and you have all the information at your fingertips. You know, why is this all happening? Blah blah blah. It's it, honestly my honest answer to that is, you know, icing it out, is because I was moving so fast that God put put the brakes on me. I was going, I was unleashing too much too quickly. Uh, I was getting too 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 deep too far to the point where I might release information that could actually cause a problem. And so I, I was basically, um, the brakes were put on and I was told to stop for years. Oh, wow. And I'm only just now getting to the back, back to the point where I'm able to finish it. Not only in terms of time, but also emotionally and, and energy. I, I just had no energy. I was so busy with work and other stuff and promoting Planet X and all the rest, having a life that I, I the amount of energy required, which is a substantial amount, the dragon's a very powerful adversary, and he's very, very against me writing this book because it contains his major secrets. Um, this um, will come out only when God wants it to come out, and not before. So I apologize, but what God wants, God gets. It's his book. I'm just writing it. I mean, you know, it's a cliche, but it's true. Um, so it'll come out when it comes out. When it needs to come out, we can be satisfied with that. Now, some people out there, um, Bob Fletcher is one of them, uh, you've probably heard of him, other folks as well, yeah. uh, believe that, um, and, and, and there's probably some, some truth to it, I, I, would, I would expect, that um, uh, part of the, you know, I don't know, for lack of a better term, forces of darkness agenda uh, to uh, topple down, you know, a, a wide variety, if not the vast majority of the developed countries and put them under a control grid, e.g. martial law, a big part mm -hmm. of that is to have that control in place uh, before uh, this, uh, you know, Planet X Nibiru manifestation becomes painfully obvious, whereby there would be, you know, mass global hysteria as a result of it. Uh, do, you, do you see a connection between... Um between the, the, the whole martial law concept and the uh, visible, uh, you know, hey, oh, there it is, kind of Planet X thing? Yeah, well, they're, they're building up for the final conflict. It's uh, the forces of the dragon arraying themselves in a final last stand against the forces of Christ. In my opinion, there's been an ongoing battle for thousands, I don't know, maybe millions of years, in which the forces of Satan, which once rung amok in the universe, would have been cornered finally in this part of the solar system. I suspect the only areas of the universe that they still control to any extent, probably only from the asteroid belt on inwards uh, to the to the sun. I'm not sure if they truly control it. They just have a strong influence. But um, I do think that the final battle involved them, in fact, over the last century, has been involved with the cleaning up of the inner solar system. That's why we have all these aliens crashed into the Earth and uh, Roswell, all this stuff, because they're being defeated and thrown down to Earth, cornered and captured and limited to Earth specifically, where they're going to make okay, their so, last so stand. You believe, now, so you believe? So you, you know, do you believe? I mean, I'm going to admit I do believe that this is true, um, but I'm not going to corner mm -hmm. you to, to agree with me uh, because mm -hmm. it's very controversial. But do you believe the wars in the heavens are literal? Yeah, there's literal physical objects, craft being used to attack each other. Yeah, there's a sphere I agree too. Naturally, but uh, yeah, you have to in order to move physical objects, you have to have physical forces. I mean, yeah, so even if you're a spiritual being, to move, so so yeah. so so what you're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong. Keep me sane. Yeah. Keep me honest. But you believe that 
even though you might be a spiritual being, in order to interact in a war capacity with these fallen beings, you may have mm-hmm. to, you know, leverage similar technologies to affect a war against them as a spiritual being, perhaps. I do think that. And, uh, for example, the mark of a craft that shows up in Ezekiel um, might actually be called, might actually be an actual physical craft. Uh, what we call a spacecraft that uh, is used to travel between various points in the heavens, perhaps to planet X and back, who can watch can speculate. And that there's at least seven of these currently patrolling the Earth, what I'm calling battle carriers, these kind of huge ships, capital ships, which not only have a uh, main uh, weapon, but also uh, carry smaller ships. And I'm actually... Um, as for my final book on the book Revelation, I'm going to provide some information on my theory that the Hebrew monetary system and the Ark of the Covenant at the top of the system is actually modeled after these, this, for lack of a better term, space fleet. Uh, all these various types of saucer-like craft, all the way from the sports model all the way up to these huge aircraft carrier type deals, which which what the Merkava was, yeah. um, which are used to transport people. Um, there's an entire fleet which has been in operation this entire time invisibly, and we haven't been able to see it, except for occasionally when they make themselves visible, as it happened with Elijah, where we saw one of these things, maybe several, yep. Yep. Uh, come down and take him up and take him off. I mean, uh, it was a chariot. I mean, it's not going to be a literal chariot with horses. That's silly. And, and, right. Uh, it, and, you know, once you get in the, out of the atmosphere, you're going to die. You have to have an enclosed craft which can take you at rapid speeds, and that's basically what a spacecraft is. It's not rocket science. In fact, well, maybe it is, but... Um, <laughs> <when it's, laughs> well said. And, <laughs> yes, but uh, I should really stop using that metaphor because I always use it incorrectly, but, um, or ironically, but... Uh, it, 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 when Lucifer fell from heaven, and the people say, you know, the translation is he was actually in a coffin covered with worms or something. The actual, the word there is a is Neville, which means bottle. And when it's used in the context of a transporting a human, it's translated as vessel. So he was in an enclosed vessel, which was traveling from heaven to earth, covered with these worm-like entities. And, you know, you've probably heard of um, angel hair. You ever heard of that? Has associated oh. with UFOs? Oh, yeah, I think so. Uh, well, tell me, I think tell, tell that me what you talking about. Angel hair is basically this long, sticky substance like spider webs that are occasionally released by UFOs. It's been noticed since the 1950s. Uh, it might be that they were talking about this. And part of my theory is that Satan's primary weapon is actually a nanotechnology, uh, known in the Bible as Surat, which is a self replicating nanobot, which Oh, can be like the stuff even. that they have in the chemtrails, the, the guys that have more gallons right. when you zero in. Yeah, yes, I agree. More gallons, yes. More gallons may be the same or something similar. And so his yeah. main weapon is to undermine, and this more gallons, small, it, looks, it appears like a small red worm or snake. It is, in fact, the snake of the garden mentioned in Genesis 3. And it is also appears in Exodus as the small red worm, which appears from the ground every morning and devours the matter. And it also is known as the, the Megepha, the uh, uh, or the disease of Egypt. Um, it's associated with the Tzarat. With the Tzarat, um, this is the major plague which will be reappear in the end times, and appears every time the fallen angels are on Earth because it's one of the primary tools they use to enslave mankind. I'll give you my short uh, and sweet wacko theory on what that is. Basically, uh, it's a nanotechnology which self-replicating, spreads out everywhere, goes on the ground, and enters in through animals and humans in through the foot. Invest, and infests their body, creates a network of fibers, which allows, when, with the implantation of a chip, for the host to be remote controlled. Uh, yeah. Basically, they lose control of their entire body. The inner network uh, acts as a second nerve, nervous system, which takes over control, actually sends me- chemical or Electrical impulses to the muscles so it could actually be used to move the person around by making the muscles move. Yep. And if they attempt to if they attempt to resist, pain compliance is used. And if they right. cooperate, pleasure compliance is used. So I do believe in the end in the end times, the end time army and indeed everyone who has the mark of the beast will have literally lost control of their bodies. 
Yes. They will be centrally, centrally controlled by a computer, which uh, by satellite or maybe by health waves will be able to communicate with these uh, these uh, networked bodies, which also this inner network acts as an aerial, an antenna, which can pick up extra or ultra low frequency or extra long frequency because yeah. it requires a, an antenna about a mile long to get those. Right. It doesn't have to be an antenna stretched out in a mile. It can be an antenna that's wrapped around Circle. the inside yeah. of a body for a mile or miles. Yeah. So you have one mile or a couple miles of antenna inside of you. That is used to pick up the signal. The signal then goes to the chip to be processed. It's orders going on the chip. Signals are sent to the to to the muscles. But then the person does whatever the computer wants them to do. So whoever yeah. gets the chip, the mark of the beast, is saying, "I am going to join the army of the beast and this fight against God's son, yep. Jesus." And that is why they're going to hell because they have made the decision to join the war against God. Yes, I would. I would even submit. I agree with everything you said. I, I would even submit it, it. It is that they are unsalvageable in the almost like the Can the Canaanites were. You know why God had to go in and and slaughter you know men, women, and children, and even the, even the animals because they were all in you know p- part of that whole uh, demon seed that came from the infestation of the fallen sons of God. Uh, you know, and that whole you know Nephilim deal. But uh, but anyway, not just uh, that. But go ahead. They may have actually been infested by the Zerat back then too. Because I do yeah. believe it was actually active at that time as well. And it's one of the reasons the Israelites were raised up was to go around and destroy all of it with the use of the ark. Yes. And uh and since we're throwing wacky theories out there, I'll throw one out there. Here's my theory. Uh uh in in, in Revelation twelve, verse fourteen, where it says, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for times, times, half a time, which is the length of great tribulation, away from the presence of the serpent. I have a theory. I think that great eagle is a technology. Just like Ezekiel's wheel, I think it's I think it's a ship of some kind, may possibly like hmm. Ezekiel's wheel, like a, a symbiotic craft of some type, and the name of that ship is the Eagle. But anyway, that's just me. I'm hmm. crazy like that. <laughs> that's interesting. It's an interesting idea. It could be true. I didn't know. Yeah, well, you know, when I when I saw the whole when I was like Ezekiel's wheel, symbiotic spacecraft, all that kind of stuff, I started connecting the dots. I was like, hey, you know, because God. Where do you get symbiotic? A symbiotic just simply means it's made up of living creatures. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you know you're living think, creatures. So, yeah, I got you. Yeah, like it, uh, for example, when you look at the movie uh, Prometheus, uh, where you have that yeah. concept of the Anunnaki having to um, th- have their neurological system merge with the chair, uh, and and when their neurological system came up with a proper match to the chair, uh, why the sh- the ship would respond to uh, their commands because there was a symbiotic match between the biology of the Anunnaki and the spacecraft itself. Uh, type of symbiotic craft, and then you have if you go out and you search on David Adair, uh, D- David D A V I D Adair A D A I R. David Adair was a child prodigy at the age of 17. Won this humongous science uh, foundation thing for creating uh, rocket engines. Uh, so significant it was that he was actually taken by some uh, senior military officials to Dulce uh, and given a tour at, at that very young age. And they took him down into a lower level uh, where they had captured a craft. And they mm-hmm. asked him, because he they knew he was a prodigy, a uh, child genius, they said, would you please go inside this craft and tell us what you think about it? Because they could not recover the engine. Uh, they, they wanted to know how to make the engine work. And so Adair went in, and he's examining the engine, and he thought to himself, I wonder, and he put both of his hands down on the top of the engine of the craft, and that craft alive. The engine actually activated yes. from from his yes. hands being on it, and I was like, that's it. That's symbiotic uh, technology, where it's actually living mm-hmm. biological technology, similar to what seems to be described in Ezekiel's wheel. And it is described in other accounts of UFOs, where the there seems to be very little difference between the UFO and the occupants themselves. Right. They fit them like a glove. And I, I have th- told you the theory that uh, in the uh, in the last battle, when we're converted to spirits, angelic beings, we'll actually be given craft that are custom tailored to meet our needs and are are more specifically what Jesus wants us to be accomplishing. And so we're actually not just coming back in literal horses; we're actually coming back in fighter craft of some kind that is created for that purpose. I agree. I agree. War. 
I know. Yeah. It's so exciting. This is awesome. Praise God. I love the last 20 minutes of this conversation. It was the best ever. Praise Jesus. That's exciting. <laughs> uh, this is it. This is what this is what God, you know, wants us to do. He wants us to be amazed with his with with uh, with his creation to look at the Bible yeah. through a clean set of eyes with un, with the understanding that we have today instead of the understanding that they had 2, 3, 4,000 years ago and reevaluate the word and say, "Hey, maybe this is bigger uh, than we've been thinking, you know, maybe those locusts aren't helicopters like Jack Van Ippie thought in 1970. Praise Jesus. So anyway, could you close with a prayer for us tonight? Sure. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to appear on Tribulation Now show with uh, John Baptist and all the wonderful people who you have blessed and motivated to work on this show and bring forward your truth and speculations about the wonders of your word and about the future glories that you have waiting for us. Please enlighten the audience and give them insight and special knowledge of your word that was up to this show and of their own studies. Indwell them with the Holy Spirit and those who are listening who are not saved yet, please give them an encouragement and dwell indwell them with your Holy Spirit as well so they may be saved from the evil times that are coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much for joining us, Douglas. This was a great show. Thank you so much. God bless you. Hey, you're welcome. All right. Bye-bye. See you all later. See you on Wednesday. Bye-bye. Praise God. Brother Elwell, are you there? I'm here. Oh, Good we're so happy to have you. Oh, yeah, it's mm-hmm. so great to have you. Um, yeah, folks uh, emailed us. They were really excited that we were going to bring you back on again. We got a full house. Mm-hmm. Numbers are very high right now. Praise Jesus. Uh, folks are very, very interested in um, in in your in your research, and um, you know, I'm, I'm sure by now they're also very curious how you. Um, uh, perceive, you know, the progress of this, you know, based on your research and the timing of, you know, your analysis of its uh, of its uh, uh, trajectory, you know, where you think mm-hmm. it might be, where when you think it might maybe manifest, potentially, uh, that kind of stuff. But anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and turn the mic over to you and say, have at it. Praise God. Okay. Uh, right now, no one knows exactly where Planet X is at. The uh, mainstream scientific community believes it's somewhere south of the ecliptic. Uh, that it actually, in its orbital path, is actually at an angle to the ecliptic. So it spends most of its orbit actually below the other planets, you know, relative to Earth's North Pole. But when it approaches its uh, perihelion in the asteroid belt, it actually uh, comes up through the uh, plane of the ecliptic and, and is actually, when it comes closer to the sun, it's actually higher in the sky than the other planets. So it's kind of interesting. It is an interesting um, orbital path. Right now, most scientists think this it's coming somewhere from the south, and the general consensus is that, that I think it's actually coming from the uh, constellation of Taurus. It'll appear in or near the uh, horns of Taurus, or possibly in Orion or somewhere in between them. It'll probably travel around those uh, constellations as it approaches. It'll probably come through uh, Taurus and then pass over Orion and so forth as it passes through the plane of the ecliptic. Right now, we don't know exactly where it is. We're pretty sure um, if it is going to be the sign of the Son of Man, the end of the age, that's going to appear suddenly in the, in the heavens as a heavenly sign of Jesus' second coming. Now, exactly what does that mean? Solar winds are powerful enough to start the comet tail to start um, forming, and that comet tail will then make it visible from, from Earth uh, suddenly and gloriously, just like Jesus describes you know, he will reappear like a thief in the night. This is what he's returning. This is what he's talking about. Planet X will suddenly and gloriously become visible within maybe a matter of day, weeks or even days. As this comet tail suddenly begins to form, people on Earth will begin to see it and realize exactly what's happening, what's been hidden from this entire time, and what's, what's about to happen. And that's what he says in, in Revelation. I think it's Revelation 6. I looked it up. Men are hiding themselves under the rocks. Uh, to hide against the throne of the Lamb because 
they can suddenly see this thing in heaven and it's approaching earth. And this happens about midway through the tribulation, I believe, actually, right after all um, the then believing Christians on earth are, 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 are Christianity, organized Christianity is destroyed and most Christians are executed. Because of this, they, they then see that God's vengeance is coming in heaven and they're about to get really wild because planet X is about to attack within the next couple of years. And so, whereas I cannot give you a time as to when planet X will occur now, will appear, I can say once the tribulation starts, it will most likely become visible about halfway between, halfway through the tribulation, about three and a half years in, three and a half to four years in. And it'll become visible by the naked eye. And then it'll appear at its, its closest point to the sun, probably about six or seven years into the tribulation, at which time it'll come close enough to Earth to actually cause you know, significant uh, disasters. And that's when you have not only the trumpet judgments, but also uh, the bowl judgments, which are uh, which are the most uh, you know, powerful effects of Planet X as it passes closest to Earth. And then right after Planet X does its damage, then Jesus' heavenly army will attack and wipe out everything that's that's left over, which won't be much because Planet X's attack will be pretty dramatic as you and pretty de, pretty destructive as it's described in the book of Revelation. We see these old judgments where you know all life in the seas is destroyed and all there is about Abraham's life. He was actually described as being having his birth uh, preceded by a heavenly sign or star as well. And so that was my my hint to say, well, this is Planet X having reappeared back then too, roughly 4,000 years ago. Then he appeared around 0 AD uh, as the star of Bethlehem. And if he reappears in our time, once again, roughly 2,000 years later, uh, the sign of the Son of Man is probably a description of yet another appearance of Planet X. So we have a cyclical uh, pattern of God returning every 2,000 years or so, preceded by this star in heaven. And when major events are about to happen, for example, the birth of Abraham in his life, which was a major event, the birth of Jesus 2,000 years later, Jesus' return an additional 2,000 years later as a sign of the Son of Man. So its exact position is unknown. I personally think, however, it is approaching. But it won't be visible from Earth until uh, it passes the orbit of Jupiter because, like comets, which are mostly a very dark uh, asteroids, which which have, which have some uh, water on, it, on their surfaces, which gives them their comet tail. Most of these asteroids and the comets are actually covered with this thick, tar-like organic goo, which makes them pretty much invisible to optical telescopes until they come close enough to the sun for sublimation to occur in their comet tail to form, at which time and only at that time do they become visible uh, by optical telescopes and human eyes. I suspect that Planet X is much similar in the sense that it also has a large preponderance of, uh, of dust and, and dark clouds surrounding it um, so that it's actually invisible to the naked eye until it comes close to the sun, at which time it actually forms a comet-like tail. In this case, it looks more like a pair of wings because in the Sumerian uh, images of this of this planet, it actually appears to be uh, kind of like it has wings instead of a tail, which is probably just the way, because it's such a large object, it probably has a lot more water, and the fluid dynamics of it is a little bit different. But it's essentially an appearance of gigantic comet, and it won't appear again visible to Earth until it passes passes Jupiter, at which time the planet X will be kind of basically being used to wreak havoc on Earth with various asteroids and comets, as described in uh, the uh, the trumpet events. Those are basically what sound like asteroids and comets striking the Earth, which are probably emanating from or uh, being as a result of planet X's near passing. So a lot of what we're seeing with the, uh, with the uh, tribulation is the description of the sort of events that would happen if a large planet passed by Earth. You'd have asteroids and comets comet-like objects striking Earth, because those are probably going to be its uh, uh, orbital path. And so it makes sense to, that you'd have giant, uh, you know, heavenly mountain, what are described as burning mountains, and these great uh, other objects that really really sound a lot like uh, comets and asteroids striking Earth, because that's what will happen. And 
Jesus himself says he uh, he uh, is immediately preceded by the this sign in heaven. And so what my theory is, is that the sign in heaven described in Matthew 24, 30 is actually planet X, which has a, an orbital period of roughly 2,000 years. And every 2,000 years or so, God has been reappearing and visiting Earth to see how things are coming along. The last time he visited was when Jesus was born, and the uh, planet X appeared as the star of Bethlehem. And next time he appears, he'll be returning uh, to conquer and take over the Earth as the conquering king rather than as the suffering servant. And the next time it appears, it'll be uh, appear as the uh, sign of the Son of Man at the end of the age, as described in Matthew 24:30. So. The planet X is we basically have this this uh, large planet, which a long period orbit like that of a long period comet, which roughly 2,000 years or so. And every time it comes back to Earth, uh, in the vicinity of Earth, and it's close past to the sun, God will actually come himself in some form down to Earth to visit Earth and see how things are going. 2,000 years before, uh, 4,000 years before he appeared to Abraham along with his two servants, uh, in a visible form, as when uh, you know, God came to visit Abraham right before he sent his two servants to take out Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he actually appeared with, uh, spoke to Abraham and visited with Abraham. It was interesting to note then, uh, the, I think it was the Apocalypse of Abraham or the Testament of Abraham, one of those apocalyptic or apocryphal literature. It says in Matthew 24, 30, that uh, the sign of the Son of Man in the end of the age will pre- precede the second coming of Christ and possibly be even a part of it, because it says in Matthew 24 that there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and the planets themselves or the powers of the heavens themselves will be shaken. It says in Matthew 24, 29, uh, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and the powers of the heavens are literally the planets. So this means literally that the orbits of the planets will be altered in the tribulation of those days, which is near the end of the tribulation. And then right after that, the uh, sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens, with, uh, and Jesus will, uh, he says, the sign of the Son of Man, and the Son of Man himself will come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so this happens right before the, uh, the uh, resurrection event uh, described in Matthew uh, 24, 31, where he sends his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and the elect are gathered together from the four winds. So somehow my theory was is that the, the planet itself it's somehow related to the resurrection event, and it's also related to the great end-time battle that will happen at the end of the time, at the end of the tribulation. Some people think that the resurrection or the rapture will occur at the beginning, some at the end. Some people are preaching two raptures. I'm actually a, what's called a seventh trumpet rapture person. I think that actually the, the, the appearance of Planet X and the, the final assault on Earth from heaven and the, uh, the assault on the uh, forces of Satan will be about the same time. Basically what happens was is the believers are resurrected, the heavenly army is formed, and they return back with Jesus to fight against the powers of, of evil. And Planet X will be an intrinsic part of that. In fact, it's very similar to the uh, the kind of the storyline of uh, the original Star Wars movies in that there's this huge planet-like object coming right towards them, uh, a, a, along with the star fleet and the rest of it. The major difference being in in the movie Star Wars, the people with the approaching planet and the, and the fleet and all the rest, those are the bad guys, whereas in the end times it appears that those will actually be the good guys. Jesus will be leading this sort of heavenly army uh, right behind him. Praise God. Brother Elwell, are you there? I'm here. Oh, Good we're so happy you guys to again. have you. Oh, yeah, it's mm-hmm. so great to have you. Um, yeah, folks uh, emailed us. They were really excited that we were going to bring you back on again. We got a full house. Mm-hmm. Numbers are very high right now. Praise Jesus. Uh, folks are very, very interested in, um, in, in, your, in your research. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure by now they're also very curious how you um, – uh, perceive you know the progress of this you know based on your research and the timing of 
you know, your analysis of its uh, of its uh, uh, trajectory, you know, where you think mm-hmm. it might be, where when you think it might maybe manifest potentially, uh, that kind of stuff. But anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and turn the mic over to you and say, have at it. Praise God. Okay. Uh, right now, no one knows exactly where Planet X is at. The, uh, the mainstream scientific community believes it's somewhere south of the ecliptic. Uh, that it actually, in its orbital path, is actually at an angle to the ecliptic. So it spends most of its orbit actually below the other planets, you know, relative to Earth's north pole. But when it approaches its uh, perihelion in the asteroid belt, it actually uh, comes up through the uh, plane of the ecliptic and, and is actually, when it comes closer to the sun, it's actually higher in the sky than the other planets. So it's kind of interesting. It is an interesting um, orbital path. Right now, most scientists think this it's coming somewhere from the south, and the general consensus that, that I think it's actually coming from the uh, constellation of Taurus. It'll appear in or near the uh, horns of Taurus, or possibly in Orion or somewhere in between them. It'll probably travel around those uh, constellations as it approaches. It'll probably come through uh, Taurus and then pass over Orion and so forth as it passes through the plane of the ecliptic. Right now, we don't know exactly where it is. We're pretty sure um, if it is going to be the sign of the Son of Man, the end of the age, that's going to appear suddenly in the, in the heavens as a heavenly sign of Jesus' second coming. Now, exactly what does that mean? It says in Matthew twenty four thirty that uh, the sign of the Son of Man in the end of the age will pre- precede the second coming of Christ and possibly be even a part of it because it says in Matthew 24 that, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, and the planets themselves or the powers of the heavens themselves will be shaken. It says in Matthew twenty four twenty nine, 29, uh, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and the powers of the heavens are literally the planets. So this means literally that the orbits of the planets will be altered in the tribulation of those days, which is the, near the end of the tribulation. And then right after that, the uh, sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens with uh, and Jesus will, uh, he says, the sign of the Son of Man, and the Son of Man himself will come in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so this happens right before the, uh, the uh, resurrection event uh, described in Matthew uh, twenty-four thirty-one, where he sends his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and the elect are gathered together from the four winds. So somehow my theory was is that the, the planet itself is somehow related to the resurrection event, and it's also related to the great end time battle that will have it at the end of time, at the end of the tribulation. Some people think that the resurrection or the rapture will occur at the beginning, some at the end. Some people are preaching two raptures. I'm actually a, what's called a seventh trumpet rapture person. I think that actually the, the appearance of planet X and the, the final assault on earth from heaven and the, uh, the assault on the uh, forces of Satan will be about the same time. Basically what happens was is the believers are resurrected, the heavenly army is formed, and they return back with Jesus to fight against the powers of, of evil. And Planet X will be an intrinsic part of that. In fact, it's very similar to the uh, the kind of the storyline of uh, the original Star Wars movies in that there's this huge planet-like object coming right towards them uh, a, a, along with a star fleet and the rest of it. The major difference being in in the movie Star Wars, the people with the approaching planet and the, and the fleet and all the rest, those are the bad guys, whereas in the end times it appears that those will actually be the good guys. Jesus will be leading this sort of heavenly army uh, right behind him. Planet X will be kind of basically being used to wreak havoc on Earth with various asteroids and comets, as described in uh, the, uh, the trumpet events. Those are basically what sound like asteroids and comets striking the Earth which are probably emanating from or uh, being as a result of planet X's near passing. So a lot of what we're seeing with the, uh, with the uh, tribulation is the description of the sort of events that would happen if a large planet passed by Earth. You'd have asteroids and comets, comet-like objects striking Earth because those are probably going to be its uh, uh, orbital path. And so it makes sense that you'd have giant, uh, you know, heavenly mountain, what are described as burning mountains, and these great uh, other objects that really, really sound a lot like uh, comets and asteroids striking out, because that's what will happen. And 
Jesus himself says he uh, he uh, is immediately preceded by the this sign in heaven. And so what my theory is, is that the sign in heaven described in Matthew 24, 30 is actually planet X, which has a, an orbital period of roughly 2,000 years. And every 2,000 years or so, God has been reappearing and visiting Earth to see how things are coming along. The last time he visited was when Jesus was born, and the uh, planet X appears as the star of Bethlehem. And next time he appears, he'll be returning uh, to conquer and take over the Earth as the conquering king rather than as the suffering servant. And the next time it appears, it'll be uh, appear as the uh, sign of the Son of Man at the end of the age, as described in Matthew 24:30. The planet X is we basically have this this uh, large planet, which a long period orbit like that of a long period comet, which roughly 2,000 years or so. And every time it comes back to Earth, uh, in the vicinity of Earth, and it's close past to the sun, God will actually come himself in some form down to Earth to visit Earth and see how things are going. 2,000 years before, uh, 4,000 years before, he appeared to Abraham along with his two servants. Uh, in a visible form, as when uh, God came to visit Abraham right before he sent his two servants to take out Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he actually appeared with, uh, spoke to Abraham and visited with Abraham. It was interesting to note then, uh, the, I think it was the Apocalypse of Abraham or the Testament of Abraham. One of those apocalyptic or apocryphal literatures about Abraham's life, he was actually described as being having his birth uh, preceded by a heavenly sign or star as well. And so that was because Earth's moon was, it's now universally agreed, was caught by the was created by a giant impactor striking Earth at a rapid rate. An impactor which was roughly the the size of Mars, not Mars itself, but about that size and mass. Striking Earth, jettisoning out a large amount of its mantle, which cooled and solidified into orbit around the Earth to form the moon. That has been pretty much, that has been proven mathematically and chemically that it has to have happened that way. Um so how do these other moons form? You know, dozens of moons on all these other planets how are they forming? Um, there must have been an actor coming in our solar system, disrupting them, uh, dropping off moons as it passes through. And this is why uh, Jupiter and Saturn have dozens of moons. They shouldn't have formed that way. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, the ring systems, why are they there? Why does, I guess, Uranus have a ring system which apparently formed after it was tilted on its side? Totally bizarre. Uh, there's so many really extreme anomalies. It's just people who are aware of how things work and understand how physics work and science and astronomy realize that the only way that these things could have happened is if a massive object, roughly three to five times the mass of Earth, possibly seven times, like one man has theorized recently, that's, that's reasonable, um, would pass close enough to them at a rapid rate to cause, you know, gravitational interactions, which would cause them to, for example, the planet Neptune to be tilted at a significant angle. Planet Uranus is tilted so dramatically that it's almost, its south polar axis is currently almost pointed directly at the sun. And that's an extreme difference from what it should be. It's like 70-something, 65, 70% off where it should be if it were perpendicular to the angle of the ecliptic. It's way, way off. And so basically right now, the North Pole on um, the North uh, Rotational Pole on Uranus is in total darkness and will be for hundreds of years. But a South Pole is is receiving direct sunlight or near to it, and it'll have direct sunlight for sunlight for for centuries more. It's it doesn't make any sense. It could only have happened if a massive object passed into our solar system from the outside at an at an angle, you know. Uh, at an you know, approach which is more or less perpendicular to the uh, orbits of the planets and interacted with them occasionally once every few thousand years, imparted some of its energy into the systems and caused these uh, axial tilts to uh, causes these moons to form through, uh, you know, just, you know catastrophic, catastrophic uh, collisions. Um, and the, the, this is not me talking. This is actual the scientists who studied the Voyager data this is the conclusion they came to. This isn't wacko conspiracy theories on the internet or Zechariah Sitchin or whoever. This is the best people in the world, best astronomers, best physicists, best people ever, top men. They said Planet X must have caused this, not me, 
not Sitchin, not anybody else. And that's why I'm so confident in this hypothesis, because it's backed up by real scientific data. The scientists are saying this, and they've been propagating this, this knowledge for, for decades. Just nobody is listening. It requires people to, you have to keep pushing. You have to say, coming back at it again and again and again. Planet X is out there. Planet X is out there. Planet X is out there. It has to be out there. The science proves it. Why don't you accept it? Why would you not accept it? That's what bothers me is people, they don't they don't think about science. They don't care about facts. They're like, what do I want? What do I don't want? And they base their decision-making based on their own personal opinions and what they want to see rather than what the facts state. You can leave the Bible out of it. You can leave Sitchin out of it. Just boil it down to the facts. Planet X has to exist, and it has to fit the criteria uh, that Sitchin suggested that it's going to enter into our solar system occasionally and become visible. Uh, the scientific, the historical back, the historical data backs this up. Uh, the Abraham was preceded by a star that came out of nowhere. The Magi followed a star that came out of nowhere. The second time, second coming of Christ, another star comes out of nowhere. Roughly 2,000 year gap between each of those. Why is it so hard to understand? I don't get it. Very easy to understand, very simple, backed by facts. Everyone agrees with it. All the traditions agree with it. The science is there. The religion is there. All you have to do is be open-minded enough to accept it, and that is the toughest thing to do because if you have all the facts, if people don't want to accept it, they will not accept it, and there's nothing you can do to change that. Yeah, amen. I mean, uh, uh, I did some research on... You know, yellow dwarf stars uh, in the Milky Way galaxy, and supposedly, uh, I, I wish I had the article handy here right at the right at this moment. I don't have another one though. Uh, but uh, but evidently, um, it's well known by astrophysicists that yellow dwell, dwarf stars, which is what we have uh, in the Milky Way galaxy, the predominant uh, or, or the, the vast majority of them are binary. That it's extremely common for yellow dwarf dwarf stars in this in this uh, in this galaxy to be mm-hmm. binary star systems. So, mm. just de facto, you know, default uh, common sense would indicate that we probably probably would be binary uh, as the other ones or the majority of the other ones are. Here's another thing that's interesting. I think mm-hmm. um, uh, April 25th of 2011 published on Cornell University site uh, is a paper by Lorenzo Lorio, who's uh, an Italian physicist, I guess. Uh, and he um, it says, uh, and the title of the paper is On the Anomalous Secular Increase of the Eccentricity of the Orbit of the Moon. What's fascinating is uh, there was a movie, because I, I personally believe, uh, and I know that it's anecdotal in a sense, but there's when you understand this, you know, when you are a big believer in spirituality, you understand the concepts of lesser magic. You understand how the devil works uh, and and how things work, you know, over the years and and actually going back thousands of years. Uh, it, it makes sense. Um, but anyway, uh, in in this paper. He wrote um, uh, uh, this scientific paper. He basically goes in and he – it's all very scientifically you know, written and says you – know, I'll, I'll give a little snippet here. It says basically, a recent analysis of the lunar laser ranging LLR data spanning 38.7 years revealed an anomalous increase to the eccentricity of E of the lunar orbit anoint, uh, uh, um, amounting to E means equals uh, 9 plus or minus 3 times 10 to the minus 12 uh, over the year cycle. The present-day models mm-hmm. of this bit, uh, dissipative uh, uh, phenomena – occurring in the interiors of both the Earth and the Moon, are not able to explain it. And then he goes down. I'm going to skip ahead. He says, um, a potential... It's my, my hint to say, well, this is Planet X having reappeared back then, too, roughly 4,000 years ago. Then he appeared around 0 AD uh, as the star of Bethlehem. And if he reappears in our time, once again, roughly 2,000 years later, uh, the sign of the Son of Man is probably a description of yet another appearance of Planet X. So we have a cyclical uh, pattern of God returning every 2,000 years or so, preceded by this star in heaven. And when major events are about to happen, for example, the birth of Abraham in his life, which was a major event, the birth of Jesus 2,000 years later, Jesus' return an additional 2,000 years later as a sign of the Son of Man. So its exact position is unknown. I personally think, however, it is approaching. 
but it won't be visible from Earth until uh, it passes the orbit of Jupiter, because like comets, which are mostly a very dark uh, asteroids, which which have, which have some uh, water on it, on their surfaces, which gives them their comet tail. Most of these asteroids and the comets are actually covered with this thick tar-like organic goo, which makes them pretty much invisible to optical telescopes until they come close enough to the sun for sublimation to occur in their comet tail to form, at which time and only at that time do they become visible uh, by optical telescopes and human eyes. I suspect that Planet X is much similar in the sense that it also has a large preponderance of, uh, of dust and, and dark clouds surrounding it, um, so that it's actually invisible to the naked eye until it comes close to the sun, at which time it actually forms a comet-like tail, or in this case it looks more like a pair of wings, because in the Sumerian uh, images of this of this planet, it actually appears to be... Uh, kind of like it has wings instead of a tail, which is probably just the way, that, because it's such a large object, it probably has a lot more water, and the fluid dynamics of it is a little bit different, but it's essentially in appearance a gigantic comet, and it won't appear again visible to Earth until it passes passes Jupiter, at which time the solar winds are powerful enough to start the comet tail to start um, forming, and that comet tail will then make it visible from, from Earth, uh, suddenly and gloriously, just like Jesus describes, you know, he will reappear like a thief in the night. This is what he's returning. This is what he's talking about. Planet X will suddenly and gloriously become visible within maybe a matter of day, weeks or even days, as this comet tail suddenly begins to form. People on Earth will begin to see it and realize exactly what's happening, what's been hidden from this entire time, and what's what, what's about to happen. And that's what he says in, in uh, Revelation. I think it's Revelation six. I looked it up. Men are hiding themselves under the rocks uh, to hide against the throne of the Lamb because they can suddenly see this thing in heaven and it's approaching Earth. And this happens about midway through the tribulation, I believe, actually, right after all um, the then believing Christians on Earth are, 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 are Christianity, organized Christianity is destroyed and most Christians are executed. Because of this, they, they then see that God's vengeance is coming in heaven. And they're about to get really whopped because Planet X is about to attack within the next couple of years. And so, whereas I cannot give you a time as to when Planet X will occur now, will appear, I can say once the tribulation starts, it will most likely become visible about halfway between, halfway through the tribulation, about three and a half years in, three and a half to four years in. And it'll become visible by the naked eye. And then it'll appear at its, its closest point to the sun probably about six or seven years into the tribulation, at which time it'll come close enough to Earth to actually cause you know, significant uh, disasters. And that's when you have not only the trumpet judgments, but also uh, the bowl judgments, which are uh, which are the most uh, you know, powerful effects of Planet X as it passes closest to Earth. And then right after Planet X does its damage, then Jesus' heavenly army will attack and wipe out everything that's that's left over, which won't be much because Planet X's attack will be pretty dramatic as you, and pretty de pretty destructive as it's described in the Book of Revelation. We see these bold judgments where you know all life in the seas is destroyed, and all the green grass and all the trees are destroyed. I mean, there's not much left, and the major cities are being uh, destroyed. All that's going to be done, left is the basically these underground bunkers, and a lot of them are going to be taken out. Uh, the, the reference to uh, Planet X actually appearing in the heavens, I think the first time mankind actually sees it. And it says that in Revelation 6. Um, where the kings of the earth and the great man and the rich men, the chief captains and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens on the rock of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? I think they're actually being, they're actually seeing uh, Planet X beginning to appear, and this, this actually happens right after uh, the sixth seal. Basically, what sounds like a massive meteor shower. Uh, it says this in uh, Revelation six thirteen, 
and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. What this means is that the, the meteor shower, like the long day of Joshua, there were so many uh, heavy meteors hitting earth, probably at an angle uh, contrary to its rotation rate. That earth's rotation is actually altered, uh, probably because the crust is temporarily displaced from the mantle, and it becomes you know, independent of the mantle temporarily slowing down or possibly reversing. And in this way, as from our current reckoning, every mountain and island is actually moved in its place because the entire crust is being displaced above the mantle by these massive, huge asteroids that are hitting the Earth, causing massive destruction to Earth's cities. There's huge. These are much more powerful than nuclear weapons. Even though they're not radioactive, they're sending out gigantic clouds of dust into the atmosphere, which will result in a nuclear winter. And for years to come, the summer is going to be colder and shorter, and, and the winters are going to be long and very cold. So God is basically breaking down the civilization that mankind had built in opposition to him by battering with asteroid after asteroid after asteroid to the point where when he actually does return at the head of his heavenly army, comprised of the believers who were resurrected, then... Uh, what he'll, he'll be more of a mop-up action rather than an actual battle. And they'll be focusing on taking out the last strong military force, which will apparently be assembling itself in the Vale of Megiddo. In, uh, it hmm? says, Lowell, L Percival Lowell's greatest contribution to planetary studies came during the last decade of his life, which he devoted to the search for Planet X, a hypothetical planet beyond Neptune. Lowell believed that the hmm? planets Uranus and Neptune were displaced from their predicted positions by the gravity of the unseen planet. Lowell started mm -hmm. his search program in 1906 using a camera of five uh, inches, uh, in aperture, the small field of view, 42-inch, 110-centimeter reflecting telescope, rendered the instruments impractical for searching. From 1914 to 1916, a 9-inch, 23-centimeter telescope was on loan from the Sproul Observatory, which was used to search for Planet X. Although Lowell did not discover uh, Pluto, Lowell's observatory uh, did uh, photograph Pluto in March and April of 1915. And it goes on to explain that the reason why Lowell uh, ultimately... Uh, even heard about or even speculated that Planet X existed originally was because of his study of uh, gods, uh, you know, little g gods, uh, of mm -hmm. um, uh, Japan, and, you know, the Far mm -hmm. East and such. And I noticed in your book, you know, you had tied in uh, some of the ancient Near Eastern religion planetary deities, and I wondered if maybe mm -hmm. that was some of the stuff that triggered Lowell into thinking, hey, this might be the real deal, and kind of, you know, thrust his research forward. I don't know. What do you think? Well, the uh, the astronomers had always been uh, motivated by the search for extraterrestrial life and try to understand our history, too. And I do think that uh, part of the motivation was to see, since there were 12 gods, maybe there were 12 uh, objects in our solar system to account for the gods, because in every uh, tradition since Sumer the Sumerians and probably before that, consistently every major empire uh, passed down from one to the other the belief that all the pla all the planets were gods, or the thrones of gods, to be more specifically, and they were to be worshipped as gods. And so every from Sumer, um, Akkad, Babylon, Assyria. Persia, Greece, and all the way to Rome, where we have our current planet names, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, these are all Roman deity names. They, uh, they felt that these, they wanted to justify, you know, prove or deny was the fact that these named after gods that have any significance. Was there, in fact, deities associated with these planets, and were there enough planets to be, uh, you know, account for all these gods? In the Pantheon of 12, it was always 12. Even since the Sumerians, 12 was the magic number. Uh, the Romans even followed this pattern. If you're missing a god, another one was put in its place to make sure you always had 12. And uh, so Zechariah Sitchin picked up on this, this fact. He had his own twist on it, which I don't necessarily agree with. But um, I, do was, I do believe his theory that the Sumerians were actually talking about literal planets moving through our solar system and causing chaos. I do believe he was correct because 
not because I wanted to, because it lines up with the facts. Now, this is not some Vilikovsky and garbage. And Vilikovsky was it was terrible. I can't even read him. Even when I was a kid, I read Vilikovsky and I realized, oh, this is garbage. It didn't make any sense. How can Venus emerge out of Jupiter and be in its current orbit? You know, it would have a hugely elliptical orbit if if it had come outside of Jupiter. It has to has to have uh, formed in its original orbital path in order to have such a perfectly circular orbit, which is another point I make in that book. Uh, or at least maybe, I don't, know, I don't know if I made it in a book, but I've made it since then. Why do the, Ju- the orbital characteristics of Mercury and Venus, why are they perf- you know, perfectly the way they should be according to normal uh, nebular hypothesis where planets form out of the nebular disk and they're either prograde or retrograde orbits, that is to say backwards, they rotate either backwards and forwards. Um, their orbits will be stable and circular. They wouldn't have any significant moons or circular satellite systems, no axial tilts, no uh, large impacts, no no oceans. They'd be very boring, basically, and they'd be basically the same way they were when they formed, according to the nebular hypothesis, when they formed out of the nebular disk. They're basically the same as they would have done, according to the scientific models, which show that Mercury and Venus are pretty much the way they should be. But when you go to Earth on outwards, every single planet is is an oddball. It doesn't match up with the standard accretional hypothesis. It shouldn't be this way. Earth should not have this 23.5 degree axial, axial tilt. It should not have such a gigantic moon. That's the only um, planet in the solar system that has uh, an ocean, which must have been caused by one or more giant impactors because... The Earth's ocean, I believe, is actually formed out of impact events which forced water out of the mantle because most of the mantle is actually comprised, most of the water on Earth is actually in the mantle in uh, uh, water-bearing what are called hydrous minerals like serpentine and talc, which are partly made of water. And when they're, when they're subject to compression by a violent force, such as an asteroid impact, they release the water chemically. The chemical bonds are broken and the water is released. So my theory is that is the same impact that created the moon also created the oceans and thereby the uh, the uh, the atmosphere as we have today because otherwise we would have enough you know carbon dioxide and water and related elements to support life to have the kind of atmosphere we have the hydrosphere we have with all the water and the rain and so forth and the clouds all these events were created by one gigantic impact and they could only have been created by one gigantic impact. Um, Earth's axial tilt, its rapid rotation rate, I mean, once every 24 hours. Venus rotates maybe three to five times as much, three to three or four times per year on its axis. We act, and we rotate 365 times per year. Why are we so much faster than um, than, or than uh, Venus or, or Mercury is also very slow. Uh, but Earth on outwards, they're very rapid rotations, as if energy had been added to the rotation by some external object adding uh, energy into the system. So the only way, in my opinion, to explain these anomalies is to say there has to be an external force coming in, adding energy into the planets, by which manifests itself in the form of causing them to spin faster, causing them to have rotational, uh, to axial tilts, whereas they should not have had axial tilts as they formed out of the nebular cloud. They should be perfectly perpendicular to the nebular, you know, the a line of the ecliptic. They're not. None of them are. Uh, even Jupiter has a slight uh, a, a, no, a, you know, angle to its uh, axial tilt. There shouldn't be any significant moons. There's no reason to have any unless there's an actor that coming outside the system to penetrate it and cause uh, the creation of a moon. I think it's uh, uh, south of Palestine area. But yeah, that's that's kind of, kind of, kind of the general idea behind the Planet X theory is that it's it's a planet that's been hidden from mankind on purpose, but it's been one of God's primary secrets. In fact, in my opinion, it is actually it is actually the great secret of the Book of Revelation. Um, when I was when I was writing the book, uh, I was I've been studying uh, an emulation and some other parallel texts that were similar to, but not the same as um, the biblical text regarding the the resurrection or regarding the creation. I mean. And a number of 
a theologian said, noted similarities between uh, the Babylonian creation epic and uh, also biblical texts. Some had theorized that the Bible had simply been ripped off from them, but others think that they were just parallel traditions drawing on the same root source material, which is my... And I noted that the description of the Babylonian god Marduk, which is Planet X in the Sitchinite theory, very similar... When I was reading Revelation 4, I recognized the description of Jesus on his throne was similar in kind of scope and concept to that of uh, the description of Marduk on his throne, almost to the point where it it seemed that uh, Jesus was actually saying, Marduk is a false god, I am the one true god, and I am the king of this heavenly throne. And I realized, you know, what if he was actually talking about Planet X, because it seemed to be kind of the idea behind the end times. If Planet X did exist, it would be a huge deal. And it would be a great secret, a very great secret that had been hidden very, very carefully from mankind for a long time. And if it did exist and it came close to Earth, it would have massive destructive effects. What if it was actually not just a part of the book of Revelation, but was actually the central secret of the book of Revelation, which will be revealed in the end times? And so I looked at Revelation 4, I realized, you know, this is a description not of some big square throne that, you know, the God is sitting in heaven, that Jesus is sitting on. This is actually a description of planet X itself. Uh, the heavenly throne is symbolically his, his, planet X is symbolically his heavenly throne. And I thought about that, and I was looking at the description of the throne, and he says it was like a jasper and a sardine stone. This is Revelation 4, 3. And there was a rainbow around it, uh, like an emerald. I realized, you know, he's basically saying uh, the sardine stone is basically a red stone. And he's saying this this throne in heaven was a, was a stone in heaven, literally a stone in heaven that was red. And I'm just taking this jewelry. This this book, this thing is saying that there was a red stone in heaven with a rainbow around it, which I think might actually be a description of what, a Saturn-like ring system. And which would Planet X would probably have too, because if there was a lot of shadow material in orbit around it, it would form a ring. So that would make sense. Um, and it also says around the throne were 24 and 20 seats, and you know 24 seats, 24 elders, and seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, and also four beasts around it. I remembered by in the description of uh, the appearance of Bardock and New Elish that he was surrounded by two sets of winds. What he was called like these objects that he used as weapons. And I remember in the Hebrew, uh, in Hebrew, the word for spirit, ruach, actually basically means wind. So the concept of these spirits around the throne could be translated as, as winds around the throne too. And I thought of that, you know, maybe there is a group of, such as a group of four winds around Marduk's throne and a group of seven winds also, two separate groups. And there's also two two separate groups of spirits or winds around the throne of Jesus, a group of four creatures, as they're called, and a group of uh, seven flaming lamps. Maybe there's, maybe they're actually talking about satellites surrounding Planet X. Moreover, uh, in another show, I was asked, um, you know, why do the four creatures, why are they described as having being full of eyes before and behind uh, in uh, Revelation 4, 6? You know, it says they're basically covered with eyes. And it's a, it, it basically the, the Hebrew word for I is ayin, which basically means nothing. It's like saying not or ought. And the concept, the application of the word ayin means when you're referring to a person, ayin refers to the eye socket or the eye in general. And when referring to a planet or an object of any kind, it's like it has a hole in it. And so if you're talking about these four objects around the throne of God, if this was indeed a planetary concept, and these were actually satellites, it would make sense because in that context, it would not be translated as eyes, it would be translated as craters. Just like our moon is covered with craters, so too these moons around planet X are covered with craters, so that makes sense. And so that's so that's kind of where I'm at now. Basically, where we have this is a situation where planet X it's going to be returning. We're going to see the same event. It's going to be the most incredible sight. And like you guys were talking about before, this this whole buildup and all these terrorist actions were being herded towards a one-world unified system. 
where which could be used to oppose the second coming of Christ and all of his forces. So it'll be basically not only the forces of Jesus and the force versus the force of Satan, it'll also be one planet versus another planet. Planet X versus Earth, Jesus versus Satan. It's Jesus' throne versus Satan's throne. You see how that works. And so it, it, it makes sense at this point, in this, in this context, that this would actually not just be a heavenly sign, like a star or a supernova conjunction of planets. It's, it is actually a planet returning from, you know, the end of heaven after a long journey, returning with weapons of war, as Isaiah describes it, to destroy the whole earth. This is what he's talking about. This is a planet returning on which Jesus or the Father will be using, Jesus will be using as one of his main weapons to destroy the dragon and his armies. And so that's kind of where I'm at now. And uh, but there hasn't been any additional Planet X information coming out recently. Most of the Planet X information of significance came out in the 80s and 90s because of the Voyager probes. And when they flew past the outer planets, they realized there must be kind of a Planet X object uh, yeah, out there because that's the only way that can we can explain these anomalies in the outer planets that the, that the Voyager probes found. But since that time, we haven't had any significant stuff because we haven't had any probes out there that have found anything. So right now, all we do is uh, speculate. Right, right. Um, what I think is two, two things. Well, one one thing in particular. Um, hmm? uh, Percival Lowell, according to the you know, encyclopedias. Uh, and I'll, I'll quote, I'll quote this to you. I don't, I don't know what the, uh, citation, actually there are several citations to this paragraph. Uh, 